happening. Hey, uh, welcome. Good evening. We are live. Welcome to Minting the Culture with uh, your host, your humble servant, Major Dream Williams. Uh, today is, as we say in the NFT space, the Genesis block, our, our, our kickoff, our, or at least my ode to uh, my culture, my Caribbean heritage, my Caribbean roots, and, uh, and those artists and, 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 and creators that have given their blood, sweat, and tears, life and blood to their, um, their love. And those people who get to see it and take it somewhere else and they end up getting forgotten. You know, this is what I see constantly in the Caribbean and being someone in the uh, NFT space and um, tech, crypto and art, you know, I felt that this was a great opportunity for me to to step up and uh, and start to, you know, talk that shit, you know, allow for those out there who are looking for their next evolution in life, looking to be a bit more a bit more responsible for the next generation. You know, NFTs, there's a lot that goes on into it. But before I even do that, you know, I just want to say a couple of things. You know, I uh, I moved here to Puerto Rico as I live in Puerto Rico. I moved here to Puerto Rico um, almost four years ago, right after Maria. I had moved here from the Middle East. I moved here from Dubai, where I had started a juice company. I did cold pressed fresh juices. Um, it's called Wild in the Moon. It changed the game in Dubai. It changed the game in Paris. It changed the game in fashion. I'm, that was something I was very proud of. But I wasn't necessarily building something for myself. I was building something for other folks who gave me a great opportunity. And I did that for two years. Now, while I was over in this side of the world, which is really, it's, they operate differently than how we operate here. One of the reasons that I went out there was because I wanted to see if I, my personality, my, my thoughts, my my dreams, hopes, and just who I was as a person. I wanted to see if that worked other places. If I had to really change my personality, if I had to really change my beliefs, or could I go somewhere else and challenge these beliefs? One of the biggest things that I feel I am able to, to do is, is be anywhere. You know, it's not necessarily like I'm a chameleon, but I can definitely find space, find comfort, find a way to connect with people in many places. And that gives me a bit of, you know, freedom. But when I really look into it and I'm talking about what makes me me, I can't help realizing that what makes me me is my culture. You know, I am Jamaican and grew up in hip hop. So um, these are two toward the forces as you would have it, you know, just uh, one being Jamaican. And if you know any Jamaicans, trust me, you definitely, <laughs> you definitely know we're, we're not the average bunch. But um, if you know some Jamaicans, you'll get to feel what I'm talking about. But um, also on, a, on the flip side of that, I also grew up in hip hop. You know, um, the 70s and 80s. I mean, I'm a kid of hip hop. Uh, 
You know, I was living in the Bronx, New York. I grew up in the Bronx, New York in the 80s. You know, hip hop was, 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 you know, they thought it was gonna be a fad. I remember the rapping Duke. Da ha da ha da ha 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 ha. You know, like they thought hip hop was gonna be a joke. But the wildest thing about it is that they never realized what was that underlying seed. What was that underlying heartbeat? They never really understood what that was. But in 1974, actually probably it was like 72, but um, you know, a gentleman named, um, you know, as we know him by the net now, Cool Herc. Cool Herc was living in the Bronx, living in New um, Bronx, New York. And he was a kid from Jamaica. He was an immigrant kid from Jamaica. And just like all of us that either are born in the States, Jamaicans make sure that you are, that you touch the culture, that you get involved with the culture. So as early as three weeks old, three months old, you're back on a plane headed down to Jamaica. Because one of the things we don't want to do as a proud people is lose our identity. Now, nobody realized that the United States had so much shiny things, <laughs> it often allowed us to, uh, to, be, to be distracted and to want and to yearn. So many people from Jamaica, as well as the rest of the Caribbean, moved up to the States and have stayed there. But those who are really about the culture, those who are really about who they are, they make sure that their kids go back. They make sure their kids spend a year or two or the summers or five years or 10 years down there. So by the time them come back a far in, they are really stewarding the culture. You know, so this is something that I always um, grew up in and I always saw in my family. You know, my father, you know, he's a Rasta. My grandparents are hardworking immigrant family. My father, my grandfather was a, um, a tailor and a shoemaker. My grandmother, she was this gorgeous Syrian woman um, that my grandfather was a real, real proud man and very happy to marry my grandmother. But she was the initial breadwinner. She moved us all up to stateside and this is my paternal grandparents, so my father's grandparents. And they moved the family up to Jamaica. I mean, to um, the States, from Jamaica. So my grandmother went first. She did like what most uh, Jamaican women did. They cleaned houses. They, um, you know, babysat. They... They did those, they did those rearing, those child rearing things while a lot of the women on Park Avenue and up in New Rochelle and, and whatnot, Westchester County, um, tend to the house of the day while they took care of the kids. These women can manage the house. And, um, and my grandmother was one of those and then some. And while doing that, she brought five children up from, the, from Jamaica and they lived in the South Bronx. And, you know, it was one of those things that my family was a popular family and, you know, we, we cultivated a lot of love and respect from so many people. And a lot of it was due to the, the, um, the precedent that my grandmother set. You know, um, my work ethic, you know, definitely comes from my family. And these things that I am pinpointing are what I deem as culture. You know, uh, these things that are uniquely us, these, the way we dress. Because at this point we're talking about, they were coming out of the sixties and seventies. So my father as a Rasta 
And at that time, like they were like more like rockers, you know, like the rockers. So they had like a style, like in a sound. And if you think about it back then, and if you think about the rockers style and you start to listen like how they would grab the, the mic and how they would, you know, sing into the mic, you then can see the parallels to hip hop. You know, I think most of my life, I've always lived on both sides. So I was always, I would always walk with a way of analyzing, yet tethering to, to things. So if I walk into a certain environment, I can look at it and liken it to some other environment that I've either been in, uh, experience, talked about, or so forth. So doing that and doing so, it really allowed me to um, to kind of see angles, see around corners. And these are the type of things that I learned to, um, I learned to deal with and, and learned to pick up as a child, mainly because of um, my family. You know, we were, we were in the States and we were also Jamaican. Right. We were not African-American. That right there is a different conversation and another influence and another conversation about culture. Because these were things that were highlighted to me as a kid. The fact that we operated in a different culture. We were different people. We were prideful about what we did. Like I dressed different. I ate different. I talked different. Different than these African-American kids that were running around. And, but, you know, again, to go back to that time and talk about what galvanized us, it really was the fact that, you know, we're immigrants, so we were getting shitted on anyway. You know, Black people in states always getting shitted on. And there was this rebellious sound that was jumping and that was cranking and that was hip hop. And that's the stuff that we talked about. You know, it was the ability to not just, not just be on a, a wave that was very musical and, and, and very exciting, but it was a way to speak your mind, especially when you didn't have a way to speak your mind. And to know that this burgeoning force called hip hop has gotten its seed, its foundation from reggae, dance hall, rockers. So the, the godfather that was credited with creating that sound, creating that that look, that feel, that swag, was a Jamaican. That's no two ways about that. Cool Herc is a Jamaican. What he was doing was taking what he saw in Jamaica and bringing it to where he was. I've always said, if you want, it's, it's not hard to make money. Bring something that works somewhere and take it to some place where it's not. Find something that works somewhere, take it someplace where it's not. That's what I always used to say, but that is, but I'm gonna have one correction with that. Find something that works somewhere, find the market, and then take it there. Because not everywhere you are filling a void that is needed. Just because it's not there, they may not even need to have it. Look at what's not in Oregon, the, uh, the Northwest, no air conditioners. And they have a heat wave. So you get what I'm saying? Like you, ba you, you, you rock based off of the need from where you are. And at that point, at that time, in that place, the need was a voice for the voiceless, a voice for the people. And that is what hip hop represented at that point. Now, 
how do you get the voice to the people? How do you get the feel to the people? You can't have everyone in your house. So you got to have park jams. Park jams are what they talk about that everyone wished they were at. That's when all, you know, that's when all the girls would come out. These guys used to take these big speakers and take them over to a light pole, crack the back of the light pole open and put, put together some wires so they can have power and just make it pop. And that's something that is akin to what goes on in Jamaica. When you're, when you're putting out the dance hall, when you, 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 you are set up, you are set up for, for like a sound clash. Like when they say a sound clash, sound clash is the, 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 the modern day versus battle. So you would have a sound. What a sound is, is a collection of, of men. Some I'm sure have women, but of men that are producers, engineers, um, writers, uh, you know, dance, like, like it's a movement. So your sound will have a certain theme, a certain look, a certain feel, because it was an entire kind of movement. So um, like a couple of the, the classic sounds, sound systems in Jamaica. Yeah, so a sound is a sound system. So they just call it sound. So um, sound system, and when you talk about the size of the speakers, when you talk about these like, oh, eight foot, eight foot speakers, people are just sitting on and they're stacked and it's just music just blaring at you. How many decibels? It's just, it's just madness, but it would bring the people out so you have one sound that's called like the mighty crown. And then you have one sound system that's called like stone love. And then they will just battle and they would just, you know, drop, drop different records, new records, new music, get the party going. Who has the best, the newest, the best, newest DJ, the best, newest dub plate. Now the thing is in Jamaica, that's different from hip hop is that the selector plays the, um, the records. The DJ holds the mic. Stateside, the DJ is on the turntables. The MC holds the mic. These right here are just the classic, you know, changes, but pretty much this is the same thing. It's just in a different place. Like we couldn't have things so loud in New York unless we did the park jams. So that's how the park jams came into play. This was just how we took something that worked somewhere and bring it someplace where it's not and found the need for it. So this is how a lot of the hip hop, this is how a lot of hip hop evolved to what it is now. What it was was simply a Jamaican youth where want just as a piece of home and who understood music. Remember this, like we're a Car we're a, 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 definitely we are a Caribbean island, but we are a cosmopolitan island. We are international. We're way more international than the United States. If you want to talk about the island, because we are strewn all the way through the United States. The edges are very diverse, but the inside doesn't get so as much. Maybe now, maybe now. Congratulations, Giannis, and all of you uh, amazing folks in Wisconsin and Milwaukee for, for winning the uh, championship, the NBA championship, just to let you guys know when, where we are. And uh, shout out to um, Sterling, because I know that you are very happy that your team won. So um, when you're back down here in Puerto Rico, we'll make sure we get a little, uh, we get take a little drink. But we, I digress. With that being said, um, 
You know, so most of the innovation, I believe just that, because obviously my, my, my mind is shaped through hip hop, through a kid that came up in New York at that time and saw the wave of what hip hop is. So I got a chance to say my mind is shaped because of that. So that's kind of what I see. I see how Jamaican Caribbean culture is used to fuel one of the strongest cultures in the world today. And that is the hip hop culture. That is that hip hop generation. That is those of us who grew up on the Fat Boys, EPMD, Run DMC, um, Fast Forward, you know, I mean, Queen Latifah, MC Light, Big Daddy came fast forward to, you know, Puffy, Mace, um, keep going, you know, Biggie, Tupac, West, everybody on the West Coast, Jay Z, Beyonce, to Lil Nas X. All of these iterations and evolutions are a form of culture stretching, culture seeping in, culture caressing, culture. You know that you hear about a lot. You hear about culture a lot. And the thing is, I know about it. Like, I'd like to, you know, let, let, let's get a definition of what culture is because. You know, it's one of those things where, and I want, because I was doing some, you know, I was doing some um, some research on this. <laughs> and as I was looking at it, I found many different ways that people are, uh, are talking about, you know, uh, what we call culture. I know the Migos, you know, they definitely, um, they definitely, are about culture. They call their album culture. One, two, and three. Is their kid is called culture because they know it. It's for the culture. This is why we do this. We are part of the culture. For so long, you know, you were meant to feel that your culture didn't matter. That something is wrong with your culture. Meanwhile, it is getting monetized left and right right under our nose. Like the wildest thing about all of this, we only think that our culture um, is across um, athlete, athletics and, um, and entertainment, just sports and entertainment. And I'm just like, that's what they led us to believe. That's what the, the people who, who benefit off of ignorance, Lack of culture, the people who benefit off of you and me not knowing who we are. They benefit off of our culture all the time. I tell people this all the time. I'm like, do you know that there are people going to Harvard, going to um, <laughs> going to these top schools to figure out ways to monetize a culture that they don't even like that much, that they aren't even born into, that their parents don't probably don't like as much. You know, and, and, and I mean, on all sides, on all sides, everyone is looking, everyone is curious about something. Um, um, it's just one of the things where there's been such a contrast. And we've, we've been alive enough, alive long enough to see where things have changed. They change so much that weed is legal in so many in so many states. Like these are the type of things that that really show me that our culture is dope as f. You know what I mean? Dope af, no doubt. Because for so long, our culture was used to build up the riches of so many, and and most of us, we had to hopefully had the opportunity to pay the price of admission to get in. But most of us didn't. Most of us didn't have that opportunity. So we had to either stick to sports or entertainment. And all of this is to say that 
you know, culture is the lifeblood of any real community, you know? And if you don't know that, we're gonna talk about this today. So the importance of culture. Culture is the lifeblood of any vibrant society. It's expressed in many ways. We tell our stories, the way we celebrate, the way we remember the past, the way we entertain ourselves, and the way we imagine the future. All of this is based off of culture. You know, when we talk about our ancestors, when we talk about the spirits that we walk with, this is also culture. They walk with us. So this is why we do things and not know why we do it. You know how many Jamaicans that you can just play a friggin', just play some type of dub play, some, play dub, some type of song, and then watch how the beat just, you know, like that's one thing about, you know, the clashes like the dub plate is it, the reason why a dub plate is such a dub plate. When we say it's a dub, the dub plate is the star. The selector is the co-star. The DJ is just up front there just to kind of keep the crowd going. But the dub plate is the star. That's why you can have 10 DJs going over one dub plate and you hear them on the same song on the same rhythm the same rhythm the same rhythm very different than stateside where hip-hop everybody is just taking break beats and they're making new new tracks new cuts so everybody wants their own original so that's kind of like another different Difference between the two cosines at the same time. So this is what this exercise is right now because it's it's funny. Not many people understand what it is. Not many other people can can separate between the two. It's very very hard for people to see. Um, and I don't know if it's mainly because they don't want to, or if they admit to it, it means something else. But at the end of the day. Without, if you aren't able to see the little nuances of change, of regional change, then you are not able to spot culture. So um, this is probably something that you need to hear and we need to talk about. All right, but um, back to it. So the importance of culture. Culture is the lifeblood of a vibrant society expressed in many ways. So like the way we tell our stories, the ways we celebrate, um, the way we remember the past, you know, that's something very interesting. The way we remember the past is can show how we talk about our culture, the way we share stories, that way we curate our stories, you know, the way we entertain ourselves. Look, I grew up in a culture that was pretty aggressive. So I grew up doing things that I would never do now. You know, I grew up and there were people fights going on. I grew up, there was um there was um all sorts of um all sorts of just you know random um wildness going on. I wouldn't run the streets as wild as I did as a kid. There was so much aggression going on, you did what you had to do, you know? So but it was the culture, it was the time. And when things evolve, you should evolve with them. And that's and and, and that's a big and that's a big that's a big sticking point for most people. Most people feel that once they have the culture, their job is to just sit with it, do nothing with it. My thing is simple. You got three jobs in life. Be happy, don't hurt anybody, and move the culture forward. That's it. Move culture forward. That means if, you live, that if you're living in a, a home with that's just totally toxic, totally negative, and you gotta get out of there and do something better with yourself and move the culture forward. That's what you have to do. So, um, but we have to understand what culture is. You know, these are just buzzwords people kind of use around, but what culture is, especially what is Caribbean culture, because that's what we're gonna talk about, Caribbean culture, okay? Um, 
you know, so the way we entertain ourselves and yeah, so pit bull fighting was a form of entertainment, just like cockfighting in certain places, just like dog racing, just like, you know, you name it. In every country, there's something, you, just like falconry is something, you know, it, it, it's the way people entertain themselves based off of their region, you know? So, um, and, um, and, then, and, and also culture helps the way you imagine the future. Like, think about that. Like, that right there is why minting the culture, minting the Caribbean is so important because it helps you navigate the way you change your trajectory. Look, we've all heard the stories and we've all felt a lot of the indecencies and the pain of you know, what has gone on with um, you know, um, post-slavery, civil rights era. You know, right now we're even in the George Floyd era you know, and all of this type of stuff. Like, you get that. You see you see the things that, that, that go on. But it's like one of those things that if you're not, if you are in the mud and you are just not an exceptional alpha, I need to do it. You just don't act like the winning sperm and you're still just trying to push. If you're not of that kind of like, metal, you know, if you're not of that stock, you're just probably going to stay where you are. That's why I know that I'm from the warrior class. Because for me to stop and go, that's that's tough. You know, but some people don't. Some people don't have the capability to see themselves further than their the squalor that they live in. Some people don't see themselves further than the block. Some people don't see themselves further than the shores. The point is, is that your ability, our ability to imagine the future of where our happiness goes, where our freedom goes, and where our culture goes, starts from where you see yourself now, most people have no clue how they see themselves if it's not in some type of designer clothing or in some car. You don't understand like who you are as a person. And that's how culture gets homogenized, okay? Gets shaded, gets co-opted, gets manipulated. Because we are the culture, not this, not this. This meat suit, the way we think, our IP, that is the culture. So, so with that, so our ability to manage the future is really, and imagine the future is really important on where you see yourself today. Because I can sit here and I can talk about blockchain, cryptocurrency, DeFi finance, NFTs, hip hop, food, adventure, these 40 islands of the Caribbean. You know, this is something that I can talk about because I embrace my culture. I also was able to see myself in a better place than what my circumstances may have shown. So I knew something about myself that most people don't. It's not a fake bravado, it's not a fake confidence. It's just, I stand, I stand with my culture. I stand with my ancestors. I stand on the shoulders. This is kind of the big thing about it. So, um, so yes, so culture is super important, you know, because if you can't see yourself in the future, then this conversation that we're having is probably not gonna go to any places because you have to see yourself in that space. I know so many that are scared, that are fearful right now because things are moving fast. The future is here. It's not coming, it's upon us. 
And most people are trying to stick their head in the ground and run away. That's not what we do. You embrace that and see where you find yourself because this is your chance. If you were waiting for a time, a flashing starting sign to say, it's your time to get on your business. It's your time to get on your job. This is it. Get on your job. We had a whole year of everything being stopped. Everything being stopped. To reset ourselves, figure a direction, and push right into that. I chose to go make sure I went right back into what I want to do, and that's to show freedom strategies for my people, show, show the ability for us to do well, show us to jump into this space that I'm surrounded by, by awesome, but yet people that aren't, aren't from hip hop, aren't from the Caribbean. They are from tech. They're from California. They are from Colorado. They are from Texas. They are from many places that we wouldn't necessarily have access to. Now, they're all here in Puerto Rico. For whatever reason, we're all here at one time. And they happen to be sitting around someone that has a couple of interesting skill sets that can utilize the information and the knowledge that I get by being around all of these monsters. All of these innovators, all of these world beaters, all of these people that have made enough money that they need to move to a place to save on taxes. And they come right down here and then we get to talk. And then I figure out what makes sense for my culture and how I can and how I can be integrated into their culture. The point is, is that you should be culture agnostic, right? Represent yours, but not think that you can't learn from others. That's kind of the biggest thing we're talking about here. Learning from others' culture, but respecting yours and knowing where your culture comes from. Knowing the things that went into it. Okay, it's very important. So yeah, so hip hop started back in 1974 by Jamaican. We understand what that culture has set the seed to then become. Wherever hip hop has gone and what has hip hop has done, we can track it, trace it back to, um, you know, these islands here in the Caribbean. You know, so I, I really respect the Caribbean. I, I love these islands, but I don't know these islands. I know Jamaica, I know Puerto Rico. I don't know a couple of other ones. So I am a searcher for culture as well. I won't, I won't say that I know it all. I am a humble student of the game, but I am a seeker. And I'm looking for you know, those out there who believe what I believe, who believe the same things that I do. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about something really, really uh, important. You know, this time that we're in, it's a very unique time. And we are doing some interesting things. Now, how are you going to be taking advantage of this? That's the big problem. That's the big question. That's the big ask. How are you going to stay within the culture and move things forward? <laughs> Okay, let me, let, me, let me finish this up because this is the importance of culture. We're talking about the importance of culture. So our creative expression helps define who we are and helps us see the world through the eyes of others. Okay, let's say that again. Our creative expression helps define who we are and helps us see the world through the eyes of others. You understand? Now, if Cool Herc wasn't able to express himself the way that he was, then we don't have hip hop the way that we see it now. We don't. Our creative expression 
helps define who we are. Cool Herc, the DJ, jams in the park, setting up, setting up all types of jams, all right? Parties, bringing people out. And it helps us see the world through the eyes of others. Okay? So one, he is bringing the world to him. He's expressing himself. And then two, you get to see how he sees the world. He needs to express the world to music. Now we get to see that's his culture. You know, do some herb. You know, that's the culture. And also, I want y'all to kind of see how all of this kind of ropes in together. You know, this is what's beautiful about the Caribbean, you know? So I tell you this, I got this um, report um, because they were analyzing the culture of Ontario, Canada, another place where they have a bunch of Jamaicans. So, um, and this was comes from uh, Wolf Brown, Ontario Arts Engagement Study. So um, it's from uh, 2012 they did this. So uh, this is very new, pretty new, because nobody really thought about culture this way much before. Most of it was like, let's stamp out the culture and indoctrinate, you know? So, um, so that's kind of where we are with that, you know? So, um, so it says, Ontarians participate in culture in many ways, as audiences, as professionals, as amateurs, as volunteers and, and donors or investors. So that just doesn't go for Ontario. That goes for everyone. Let's go with these again. So Ontarians or everyone participate in culture in many ways, right? As an audience. Right, right now, sit down and talk to each other in audience. Or you sit down and watch it. And audience. Easy. Way to go. Buy ticket, show up. Here we go. Yeah. So, okay. As professionals, I get a job with Exxon. And once Exxon, I'm walking into the culture of Exxon. Boom. As a culture. You know, you go to um, Charlotte Bobcats, or they have a culture from their team. You go to Los Angeles Lakers, you realize the culture of their team is a little different. Culture. So that's as professional. So as a professional, you normally adhere to the culture of your professional work environment. Culture. Amateurs. College. So you play football. I think you don't even play football. You go to school and you root for your football team. Or you go to school and you take a certain amount of classes. You go to Harvard. Harvard has a culture. That's a Harvard man right there. You go to Hampton. Hampton has a culture. That's a Hampton man right there. You, know, you go to UCLA, USC. Both have two distinct cultures, but very prestigious schools, nonetheless. And also, that's as amateurs, all right? Volunteers. So many, um, many people who, uh, who volunteer, they have a certain culture. So um, you volunteer to clean up the beaches. You, um, you intern. You, you volunteer to, to give food or donate blood, or you volunteer. Once you volunteer for a, an endeavor to help, you normally share the same, um, the same ethos. You normally share the same overall feeling. That is a shared culture. 
That is part of a shared culture. Um, donors, obviously, you know, those who want to donate to some stuff, you better be somebody right with what they're thinking about or else you're not going to get anything from them. So definitely mindset, behavior, that's another way. You're not going to get donors or investors if you don't share similar overlaps and overlays to culture. You know, it's a very important thing that they see themselves in you or they see you in them. What we're talking about overall is relatability. We're talking about a bit of empathy. You know, some people very well will call me all sorts of names. You know, sometimes I'm not the most, uh, I'm not the best deliverer of news. You know, they often say that Jamaicans, we are the nicest, rudest people in the Caribbean. And, you know, sometimes it, it, it offends. And really from the deepest bottoms of my heart, I truly am sorry that I offended you because that definitely wasn't my intention unless it was my intention. But with that being said, I realize that my culture sometimes is a little abrasive, is a little defensive, maybe even a little aggressive. But all of that comes up with growing up in a culture of strife, stress, pressure. These things make, make the idea of empathy initially a little hard. You have to develop the culture of self-healing, the culture of mental health. These things are all cultures that are developing that are recently getting introduced to the, um, the men in a lot of the communities I grew up in. We never had to have that. Our stuff was, oh, you're trying to take my head off? I'm taking yours off first, harder, faster. Now it's like, oh, you're trying to take my head off? Well, why is that? Are you okay? Let's talk. Maybe we can see a better way around this. You know, that's how culture has developed. So, yeah, so um, that's the importance of culture. So we talk about a couple of other things. So in addition to its intrinsic value, what culture provides, important social and economic benefits, okay? So in addition to its intrinsic value, culture provides important social and economic benefits. That's what we're here to talk about today. In addition to its intrinsic value, the way it makes us feel, its intrinsic value, I don't know how it's feel because it's objective, right? The way that makes you feel, it also provides social and economic benefits as well. So this is why we meant the culture because it can provide social and economic benefits. That's the reason why we're minting the culture, folks. So, so with improved learning and health, increased tolerance and opportunities to come together with others in the community, the culture enhances our quality of life and increases overall well-being for both individuals and communities. All right? Let's do that again. So in addition to its intrinsic value, culture provides and important social and economic benefits, okay? You have your intrinsic value, you have how culture makes you feel. I'm a proud Jamaican, I'm a proud Caribbean man. I'm a proud, I'm a proud proponent of hip hop. I'm a proud child of hip hop, you know? So that's my intrinsic value. I think it's important, you may not, but that's what we're trying to unlock, but we, uh, we say it right here. We realize that it just doesn't hold intrinsic value that makes me get the old, the old fuzzies and, and, and the cuddlies and the warmth. What it has is the economic and social benefit. Social and economic, economic and social. Social and economic. Social, 
It's how people see you. Social is your status. Social is your media. Social is people not stopping you on the street thinking that you are going to do something to them. Social is allowing you to just not be racially profiled. Social is them taking your, your um, giving you the benefit of the doubt. Social. If your culture is understood, you get the benefit of the doubt socially. You get to live different places. You get to go different places. You get to feel, feel a different way about yourself. I mean, the economic benefits speaks for itself. People understand my culture. Guess what? You get a different job. You get, I mean, isn't that how it always been going? You know, like a lot of these mediocre people that are in your jobs. These people are the reason why the world is the way it is. All these mediocre people getting these jobs. But the beauty and the amazing qualities of a diamond is that it's only formed under pressure. So all of these mediocre people that have been running these industries, that have been having these jobs, their days are coming because the pressure that a lot of these cultures have been under that has forced them to build skills, to build a different way of being, to gain that nimble mindset that will allow them to level up during a black swan event like we had last year. These are the people that I'm, I'm, I'm talking to and I'm running into. These are the people. They've been under pressure for so long and now they now it just got cracked and they see where they can make opportunity and they are thriving and, and, and pushing forward. This is for them. This conversation is for them. This conversation is for the culture, the culture creators, the culture movers, the culture shakers. You know, and for that much, it's for the culture savers as well. You know, I'm trying to be a bridge in between both. Those who save culture and those who push culture. And I'm trying to bring it together with a worldview and um, a bit of innovation and, uh, and tech. So uh, I'm pretty excited about that. And I'm pretty honored to, to be in this space. And I think over this time that we'll be doing this together. Um, right now, I'm doing this right in front of you, but soon I'll be doing this thing in the metaverse and doing some cool stuff. But wanting to be, um, wanting to have a, a way to kind of give back to my people, give back to what's given me so much, what's given, what's given me the ability to kind of feel that that I could be the person to give it to you. You know, I hope that by the end of this, that we feel that I am, but even more so, I hope by the end of this, you feel that you're the person to hear this information and you're the person to change and shift culture. It's not me. I'm already here doing what the fuck I got to do. It's you. Hopefully from this, we can get it going. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a long paragraph, apparently. <laughs> but in addition to its intrinsic value, culture provides an important and social and economic benefits, okay? both. So hopefully, once we understand what this can be, we can use the culture to help us all get ahead, all right? With improved learning and health, increased tolerance and opportunities to come together with others, Culture enhances our quality of life and increases overall well-being for both individuals and communities. You know, so this, this, this is one of the things where this is one of the where it's um. Yeah. 
Better now. Okay, I'm back. Got you. We're back to. So um, yeah. So culture is really important. So it it helps the individual and the communities to have well being. Now it didn't say wellness. It didn't say well. It didn't say. It's well. well get um, offended, you know, when when you say something, you know, weird about their culture. And I'm not and I'm saying it, it all is culture. The type of women that you like, the type of men that you like, the type of food that you eat, you know, so much so like when people say stuff about it. Oh, you eat fish with bones. I guess you don't. You get what I'm saying? How people react to you is triggering, I feel, a lot of times. And a lot of times, as a Jamaican and as a child from the Caribbean, 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 either which way, a child from there, there's certain things about these islands, this music, this food, these people, these smiles that really stand out. They stand out a lot. Um, I say this only because I got a chance to kind of see it work. And I just knew that there's been many times in my life that I have felt and seen how being Jamaican and others learning that I'm Jamaican or of a Jamaican family or that my family is Jamaican. I saw how it changed. It changed us so much. It switched up on us a lot. You know, not to make this even more, but my father passed away. He died when I was five and he got killed, shot in the head. And I know this for a fact. The murderer got off because my father had dreadlocks. And the murderer was another black man. You know, so because my father had dreadlocks, he was looked at differently. Dreadlocks wasn't as cool as it is now. Back at that point, it was a little different. It was a little different. So, um, so yeah, so I saw that and, you know, being called a Jamaican booty scratcher and being made fun of and picked on, you know, kids can be, kids can definitely be, uh, 
be mean. But then you fast forward it to me being, you know, brought into, you know, royal family of Dubai, you know, mainly because the juices that I was making out there are juices that my grandmother made, you know, the type of things we make in Jamaica, you know, and then when they find out that you're Jamaican, they really want to meet you. Oh my God, a Jamaican? What, oh, what is Jamaican? <laughs> Jamaica, where, you know, where is where is Jamaica? Where is Jamaica? They they don't know. Just this this, this Jamaica. What, what 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 is Jamaica? Where is Jamaica? Africa, Africa? No, sir, not not Africa. No, 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 no. It's in the Caribbean. You know, um, you know, like Bob Marley, man. Like, uh, oh, Bob Marley, oh Jamaica, oh man, it's Jamaica. Yeah, man. Oh, oh, hold up, say it with me. What I want? Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, and it's a. Uh, and it's something different to that, you know, and it just changes the vibe, changes the mood. Just when I talk with an accent and, 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 and embrace my heritage, you know, it's, it, um, and because that it does that, sometimes I don't even want to talk my accent because I'm like, yo, it just make people like, I was like, I'm the same person. <laughs> I was like, I'm the same person. So, um, but it, it, it shows me culture. It shows me what, what, what's important about the Caribbean. You know, um, recently, speaking of Caribbean culture, and we are, like I said, I'm Jamaican. So I know Jamaica, I know Puerto Rico. I know things about other islands, but I don't know um, everything. And obviously I'm balancing an American heritage as well, American culture as well, so that kind of is something else that pulls. So I am a Mitch, a hodgepodge of both. So, you know, but definitely we talk about Caribbean. All right. The Caribbean is a group of islands. I, I go with a nice round number of 40 islands, but there are over a thousand islands in the Caribbean. Okay. Just to let you know. But I'd say 40, 40 major islands and or territories. So you have that. So that is the Caribbean. Now, they're broken down into three sets of islands. They have the main Caribbean. You have the Greater Antilles and the Lesser Antilles. All right. So these are three chains and sets of islands that sit on the Caribbean shelf which is something I just found out recently. When I say recently, maybe a year or so ago, because Puerto Rico had a thousand earthquakes last January, January before last. So yeah, man, we are on a Caribbean plate <laughs> um, that does get some seismic activity. That's something that I found out. But, um, but these islands, man, they are so amazing. So amazing, so amazing. Each of them have their own version of rice and peas. Each of them have their own portion and version of carnival. Each of them have their own type of music. Um, you know, people are gorgeous here. We are made of many. It's on the day. Taino. Arawak. African. Spanish, uh, East Indian, um, Chinese, um, where uh, Middle East, Middle Eastern. All of these have migrated to the Caribbean and every island, oh shit, and the Spanish, yeah, and every island feels some are more English, some are more French, some are more Spanish, but all of them are Caribbean. All of them have beautiful sunsets. All of them have gorgeous beaches and gorgeous people. So um, definitely. But I realize this, I just know really two of the islands. I don't really know all of them. Jamaica mainly, Puerto Rico, 
So I want to move back to the Caribbean and learn it. I'm in Dubai at that time, living life, loving life, and end up meeting a goddess. And when I say that, I don't use it lightly, my friends. I met a goddess. And she became, and she became my teacher. And what I was able to do was take that. What I was able to do was take that to a to a space that really kind of helped me build myself. Up. You know, and when I left that. I'm just alive. But, but um, what I was able to do was take that as as a student, as a pupil, and really be able to to pick up the game. And what she told me was, "You're supposed to go go back to the Caribbean. You're supposed to go back to Jamaica. You're supposed to take your knowledge here. You're supposed to go back." And get back. And I was like, okay. Like, I didn't even question it. I left. I met her in Bali. I left Bali. Went back to Dubai. Packed up everything. So my partners, I was leaving. And moved back. I did all that in one week. And that was to take myself and put myself back in the Caribbean because that is where my ultimate growth is going to be you know you do you always need someone and some people and some bodies to be able to give back to and this is my version of giving back and that was to come back to the caribbean and mint the culture i mean at that point i didn't know what i was going to do and i needed some time to figure it out over these you know three and a half four years but uh, i definitely realized what is real. So Caribbean, a bunch of islands, uh, um, the different, the different, different sizes, different elevation, different terrain, different people, different food, you know, different, you know, most of them have the same kind of um, temperature and stuff, but definitely uh, different accents, but, um, but they are very much the lifeblood of this area. And I look at the, the, the Caribbean as a microcosm of the world because each has their own, each has their own colonial tie. Each, France, Lithuania, England, Spain, you know, all of them have their, their own. So I've always felt that Caribbean is one of the the, the most important places in the world because it is a, um, a microcosm of the world. All right. And so this brings me to a story you know, because all Caribbean islands are not homogenous. You know what I mean? Just because you can do things on one island, you cannot do things on the other island. Case in point. I need two stories. So I live in Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico is a for all intents and purposes, a, a colony. One of the oldest colonies still left. They are technically a department of Congress. Now you're like, what the the hell are you talking about? Puerto Ricans are real people. They have rights. Yes, they do. But for some reason, when Puerto Ricans or Puerto Rico itself comes up, the United States doesn't really take it that seriously. I guess the only Puerto Ricans they take seriously are the ones that come from the Bronx. Because apparently I hear they cut people. But, but with that being said, Two months ago, there, um, there was like a spring break and there were two young 
men of color that came down, black men that came down, that uh, wanted to come down and hang out. Now, the thing is about these islands, you know how to act on different islands based off of who's here and based off of who you deal with, where you come from. So I'm going to say this from now. What these kids did, they would never do that in Jamaica. They would never do that in places, you know, Spanish town, you know, trench town, jungle, you know, pretty in They definitely wouldn't do that in Tibet. They wouldn't do that in Greenland, in Mongoose. They wouldn't even do that in Tibet. These young men decided to come to Puerto Rico on vacation and come and disrespect the culture. Look, I'm not really going to go into it much further, but trust me, they learned a lesson after that. At least the one gentleman that left the island alive left with a lesson. The other one, He's gonna have to take his lesson in another life. But that was something right there that showed you culture. People coming in to disrespect the culture and the culture slapping his hand way more than um, a hand slap. But that was the culture reacting to disrespect. That was happening in Puerto Rico. So now, sorry, number two. We ship to Trinidad. Trinidad is a little different island. Trinidad has national resources. Trinidad has gold and oil. They have a black, black Taino and East Indian Indian population there. They have one of the best. Carnival seasons anywhere in the world. One of the best carnival seasons anywhere in the world. And during that carnival time, I mean, I'm talking about one of the best. I know white girls that come from all over the country, all over the world, to go to that carnival. It's sort of like how, you know, people fly all over the world to the Burning Man. This right here is that equivalent, but it's just better in the Caribbean, all right? So that is the setup. Now, they, they have an enormous, beautiful party called Juve, spelled J-O-U-V-E-T or J-O-V-E-T or J-U-V-E-T, either which way, it's called Juve. Now, let's take a picture right here. In Hollywood, there is a certain checklist that every A-list actor has, right? Certain checklist. It's the, you do action shows, you start off doing in these, you bubble up, you bubble up, you do action shows, you do, um, you know, I become a leading man, so you definitely have to do some sort of James Bond type of thing or some Jason Bourne type of thing, so you out there. Then, you're black man, so you got so, you know, you throw a, a real popular black movie out there. And this one starts. His name is Michael B. Jordan. He's decided to go to Trinidad and Jordan. The bar. We check out. And because in how they listen, they have a checklist to go through. Okay. Checklist was later. Right? I need to go there. Because of the 
Change the name than the culture. Let's say that again. The culture say there's the guardians of Trinidad culture reached out, including those who are. In Hollywood, those who are in music, reached out to this young man, gave him an option, and he chose to change the name rather than to tip the culture. How much wrong is this man going to sell? I know he's going to sell, but that's not because of the Change, but then it's changed. I'm not doing that. But you missed out on opportunity. I said, tip, 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 And you want to keep it for yourself or your investors. When the biggest investor the biggest investor is culture. It's also the show that shows you that one three is not just one thing. Black people. Not just one thing, and just just because you're black doesn't mean you're Caribbean. That's what I want to talk about. You know, just because you're a black person does not mean, mean that you are Caribbean. All right. So, so that right there is something that I wanted to pinpoint. So, those two sorts of people disrespecting the culture and getting the opportunities to make things right. One actually. You really got slack on the wrist. The other one, that's the one. You know, so it's, it's just one of those things where I just don't, I think we've gotten so used to just being cultural cultures and spectators and interlopers. We never really had to earn the price of admission. And that's because culture is so inviting. We haven't been culture, so, so it's mainly because that, you know, this is, you know, this is actually that I could look back. And that's just a combination of looking, you know, uh, of giving people the access that I have and, and challenging with it our life. You know, it's, it, it's such a, it's such a real, Real, real time, right? Yeah. That this is where you are going to change the trajectory of your family to sit and look at your family's well being and know that I have an opportunity to do something different. I have an opportunity to do something that's phenomenal. I can change the trajectory of my family legacy. And this is why my goal is to mint the culture. The Caribbean, the Caribbean, the Caribbean, whichever way you want to call it. It's 
the city of Thailand. We have some of the most inspirational people, some of the most asked people, and you know, the ghosts and histories of, of the pirates. You know, of those flashbacks. Those that came out here to rich port to look for gold. All their riches. This one. That had been the chance to meet. So we found it to meet. 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 We have our problems. Sucks. You know, pretty much. You know, we have that 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 tag on the back of your shirt. Property of, or if lost, returns to, or if found, returns to. That's what we're talking about. If used, return to, or if tipped, or if used, revenue goes to. Invoice, you know what I mean? Like, like, who should be in voice? That's what we should say in the Caribbean. Who should be in voice? Because at the end of the day, there's more conversation about reparations than there is about utilizing the technology to optimize and maximize our returns of our culture. That is what we have an opportunity to do today, folks. Make sure that people know that these culture vultures. Now, because ex socioeconomic things have happened, these the ways that people live, there's more people living on top of each other because more people are like poor. But so there will be people that will probably historically that are living in your culture that probably would necessarily be embracing the culture as much, but because socioeconomically they get put into the culture this lets me feel that there is they have and have not culture as well that so yeah this right here is more than just this one but the, the idea of making it that time stamp is that if any vote should that choose to come in and maximize our ones in our culture Masterpieces that have been just held in 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 would it be any type of vault or any type of conservatorship or so or any basements? I know, I know, for, I know two or three families on this side of the And these people are ones who want, again, they want to be stewards of the culture, they want to be savers of the culture. At times, in my mindset, a little bit too, too old. 
a lot of our appreciation. You have a lot of people who see the nation in the world, and you have a lot of people who blame the way the world is right now on those old art cards and the people thinking that mindset. So, where I find myself is simply a bridge to both. I speak a certain way, I speak a certain style, I talk a certain way, I'm into certain things, I have certain friends. I'm Looked at as an industry leader, expert, influencer, whatever that you want to call it, and I'm thankful for all that. But I use that to bring both sides together and see how can we uplift the character and make it resilient. Nobody wants to beg. Nobody wants to beg for people to save them. We want to be able to do it ourselves. We can do it ourselves. We've been doing it for many years. We're still here. We're still there. 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 We're we can make insights in the heart for those that are the savers and those that are being created to the leader of the pushers of the star. So now I say all that and talk about what I, so what am I going to do to bridge all this? Three lines, folks. N F T. For those of you who don't understand what that does, does mean, it means generational wealth. It means no more middlemen. It means your IP is your freedom strategy. I'll let that sum for a bit. So, freedom strategy. And that's easy on that. So, what that is, it's a non fungible token. It's a, it's a um, protocol, a standard that was created by, like, I might be wrong. Just fact checking if I'm doing um, I want, I want to say, if they were made, or it was one of the, the um, that was one of the videos, like somebody like CryptoKitties or, or, uh, or something like that, something else, not CryptoPunks. But either way, this one, this one, what do you mean by that? Okay. But, um, this one, this one, to give use to 
your uniqueness. It's a way to highlight your special special. It's a way to highlight who you are, right? Now let's think about that in the world. How many times have you been contacted by a fake um profile? Have you ever been contacted by a person in Nigeria? Have you ever been contacted by you know, someone trying to deceive you? you know, have you ever bought an alcohol? Oh, we've done that. Think that's real. Have you ever bought an alcohol? Chain, think that's real. It's like a team. He's infinite. Let's see how you do. Is my test. 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 My Thousand, 
needed Bitcoin. Up here, dear. Up here, dear. System. That was just about. I think it was just directly deal with the money. I didn't have to pay. I didn't have to borrow money from him. Give somebody. I didn't have to just deal. Do you know what I mean? Guess what? I didn't know you. How are you? I didn't know you. I didn't know you. I didn't know you. But you just three at me. Get all the time. Put it up. And you have. I need what you need. Just make it happen. It's like I do And wait, one, three days, or like something like that. Like, come on. I mean, the best, the best thing about my chance is that it's happening. You said this is the wrong person. One thing about the code is you said the wrong person is theirs. Somebody called me the other day and was like, basically, I sent you $500 back. I said, it. I'm like, well, I don't know this, but two. Uh, no. No, I didn't even say it, but it's like, the fact that you have to call somebody to see if I sent you money by accident and then I can't fix it and take it back. That right there is, is why NFTs are important. So you can always verify people. And you send it to So, you know. And, and the tech allows us to do that, allows us to put things on <clears throat> a lot of So the funny thing is this, you'll say, so she like made it go. And yeah, whatever, he did, but he just made it, right? It's all about how we use it. It's technology we did back in like the 80s because what we really did, we created a blockchain, which means it's a time stamp. And what is the time stamp? It has a fence. Don't. A time card. I went into work. When I work out there, I was. That's all it is. So that's all the blockchain. It's the second. I think. But. I think. Blockchain is the time stamp. I got to check it. That's what I'm going to do. The beauty of this is that it's not even thinking a lot. It's not even open. Decentralized on that, so I can see where everything came from. I can see that. Oh, this person with nine figures in his bank account. That's a money transfer from this country, and oh snap, and this country is in war right now, so maybe that money might be ill gotten. KYC, AML, those are small letters, just like NFTs. So now I'm talking KYC, know your client, AML, anti money laundering, all of these things, or at least those things, get your ass put in J A A I L. Okay, so um, this is not what you want. You don't want those alphabet boys running down. So the goal is to use it. Tech to the best of its ability to use the tech and the innovations in the tech to bring the whole art world together with the new art world and bring them into the middle where we can create it and teach some beautiful technology. Now, how do we make the culture do that? How do we make it? We make it befriending. Beautiful, yeah. My granddaughter from the old family, and I want to cook for her. You bring her over to your house, you show her the art, and she will probably start. Let's talk about her art and her family. And exactly, let's go. Okay, you go over. You have the art, you bring her. Nice bottle of wine. Or bottle of champagne. So you do that. Okay. Let it go. Let it be nice. Very nice. And, and while you're being nice, you are admiring the core. You're admiring the 
their their tapestries, they're reminding the family seal, they're reminding the way the dog, the dog is, is combed and, and combed. You know, you know, you're admiring the way that the food is made, and, and, and all the time you just express appreciation for culture, expression of appreciation for culture, and then you talk about what does culture and art have in common? The fact that they could last forever using technology. And putting it on the blockchain. They may look at you, look at you like, what are you talking about? Blockchain technology? Like, okay, check this. If I can make a digital rendition and version of your paintings, that, if I can make that into an NFT, a non fungible token, I mean, into an experience. You then are able to have like a fango experience that's going on right now. Sorry. You can You can have you It's going to be remember. And have you paid to end certain members. This is these are ways of technology. Being able to enhance what the world has got to be used on. This is what technology allows you to do as a owner of this art. You get to not just carry around a big old painting that's heavy, afraid, and people try to steal from you. Nah, you get to carry a cool digital rendition of your. Masterpiece, and then you get to share it with the world, and then you get to create a whole different stream off of it. And it's so different than then it just sitting in your study, where only a certain choice few get to see it. People that you probably don't even like anymore. How are you going to leave this world? Because things like Forever on the I don't know about this piece of art. This art, very well made. Decay, very well made. Get back, get back. Get back, you know. You know, but on the blockchain, it lasts forever. And you can put it all over the place. You can put it in museums. You can put it so many things. That's what the tech can do. So then after they are asking you when are you with a brand new game? Because you are now showing up that you can use the word of their culture, their family assets. You now are figuring out what you're going to do all the time. This is what you think. Great culture. It's on. But then I told you. They're falling out. Mint 
mint, establish, educate, build, empower, um, you know, um, lead into the future, follow, learn. You know, one of the things about a lot of these islands, I tell folks, you're going back into the past when you go to these islands. But the one thing they kept up with us with is empathy. They understand feeling. They want to feel good still. So art makes you feel good. This is how you curate. This is how you 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 hold culture for those moving forward. You mint it, and you give it. Make it fun. Make it make it, make it nostalgic. Find liquidity, you can help you find 
you know, in art markets, we can help you find something to own against. So for those emerging artists, we have education. And for those collectors, those who collect, there's always we help you find it. It's tough now for everybody. I can't tell you this much. And these beautiful items in Kevin, you will find, you will find some of it. Some of the greatest gems the world has offered. And that is its people. Oh, this is an exercise people. So we have this way. Everything. Another. Chuck's solution. Is everybody wants to be helpful. Everybody wants to be valued. And what this does right here is allow for us to start to trade our value, to create, trade our own intrinsic value. Allow me to create a metaverse and and do things. This is where we're going, folks. We're already here. Look, <laughs> I'm just saying, uh, this ain't this ain't a joke. This is real. Now, I just want to know that you are the culture. Please reach out, subscribe, uh, follow artmob.io. Um, if you are on Instagram, it's uh, Plant Based Man. Well, shout out to all the vegans out there. Um, if you are on, what else? I think I'm on Twitch, Major Dream. Um, airtime. I'm going to use Twitch, Airtime, and Twitter, and Instagram. And it's going to be Major Dream on all of those. 